Did your parents say something like this? When I was a kid, I had to walk to school in the snow uphill both ways. Yeah, my dad was fond of that line. But for me today, it's more like when I was a kid, I had dial up internet and I liked it for upload and download. (laughs) Fast forward to today. Wow, we depend on Wi-Fi like never before. The everyday demands that your Wi-Fi network are under are tremendous. Whether it's working from home, streaming video from home, producing high quality electronic engineering tutorials from home. Oh wait, that might just be me. (laughs) Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Fortunately, there has been an industry-wide effort to make our Wi-Fi connectivity a whole lot better. And I, for one, couldn't be happier. In this episode of Chalk Talk, I am chatting with Tony Testa from Corvo. And we're talking about Wi-Fi 6 and 6E that is going to bring a variety of benefits across the board. From improved efficiency, increased capacity, and increased speed. Tony and I discussed the expansion of the Wi-Fi spectrum, the latest in Wi-Fi mesh filter technology, and how the convergence of standards in this space is going to make a world of difference. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Corvo. Hi, Tony. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Amelia. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for asking. All right, so we're talking about Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E today. But first, Tony, what exactly is Wi-Fi 6 and 6E? And does my router do this today? Yeah, great question, right? As we look at the standard evolutions of Wi-Fi and the generational updates, Wi-Fi 6 is the current latest that is out into the market. And 6E is the next evolutionary change to that, where we've had some great advancements in the uh, spectrum that's usable. Unless you had bought a specific Wi-Fi 6 or 6E router recently, then the answer would be no. Your your current system would not do that. But uh, we are going to discuss today a lot of the benefits of why you would want to go into that direction. Okay, great. So it seems like smart home is a huge topic today. And it seems also that this would lead into that discussion, right? Absolutely. Yeah. If we take a look at the really the acceleration of the evolution of the smart home and the existing, you know, environment we're in today in in society, certainly the pandemic has created a lot of disruption in our day-to-day lives. And uh, here you see a couple good depictions of, you know, the work from home, the school from home, online medicine, the need for a robust home network and connectivity globally in this world today really has brought some advancements into Wi-Fi 6 acceleration into the market. It drives into, you know, really just a robust appetite for more data, more speed, more connectivity. That makes sense. Tony, what speeds are we really talking about here? If we look at really the different standards that are available in terms of our communication and connectivity, specifically within the home or in the campus environments, This slide really depicts well the different standards and where they sit. And the Wi-Fi standard you can see there tends to lead in terms of data throughput, the cellular dimensions, of course, but in a much more localized area network, right? It doesn't span the the same openness that cellular can bring. With that, you know, we definitely have gone past the one gigabit per second and, and making headway towards 10 gigabits per second. And as we start talking about further advancements in the system towards Wi-Fi 7, we'll see some, you know, continued 4X gains on on even those type levels. The type of applications that really feed on this really bring back the centerpiece of, of the smart home and home automation. We'll talk a lot about the centerpiece of Wi-Fi really creating that conduit of securing and passing your data from all the client devices that are tied to it back to the cloud and how it can do that with really good full home coverage or full office type coverage. So as we take a look at the smart home and the evolution of the smart home, we'll really examine a couple key premises of the advent of Wi-Fi 6 and 6E and what it brings. And although I'll be reading these fairly verbatim, I think the the point will come across that the standard evolution brings across unsurpassed capabilities in home coverage, the additional client communications and number of client communications, 
focused backhaul links, which sets foundation of realization of being able to get the smart home off the ground. Wi-Fi mesh and Wi-Fi really combines us with companion connectivity links and now an industry effort across all the major players for additional coexistence and interoperability. So this really will start shifting what we see today in the smart home is a very fragmented space where oftentimes you'll buy some gadget or system. It'll need to connect into its own router or gateway, which then connects into your system and really make this more seamless into the existing backhaul capabilities that the mesh network will provide. Okay, so Tony, is there anything new that designers need to give their customers the 6E experience? Can they use the same Wi-Fi router or gateway designs? You know, Wi-Fi 6 is going to bring enhancements across the system in several areas. And so designing for Wi-Fi 6 at a product level, as well as just the end product to consumers, is going to have lots of advantages, but also lots of changes in how the systems will be optimized. If we look at really the performance in dense environments, Wi-Fi 6 has a much more advanced performing capability. So more clients can connect into the network. You can have, you know, users sharing basically slots that used to be only streamlined to a single connection can now be shared across, you know, four different connections from clients and share that same spectrum. If we look at battery life extension, right, by having faster throughput, faster data rates, you know, more enhanced connections, the battery lives can be extended because you have shorter bursts of needing to transmit and receive. If we look at throughput as well, you know, as we've talked about almost getting close to 10 gigabits per second, so roughly a 40% improvement at the theoretical rates compared to the previous generation. And then overall network efficiency because of all this passage of data, how the data is managed. And so this goes back to the core system itself. Applications, of course, you know, there's a few here talked about, but really starting to move towards high resolution video. If we look at, of course, the video conferencing that we've all been doing and having 10, 15, 20, you know, different faces streaming video, 4K, all at the same time those VoIP and and video conferencing applications have become really bandwidth hungry. Gaming, you know, is becoming a very interesting aspect as well as industrial when we look at AR, VR opportunities to really tie high bandwidth connections as well. So again, just a a few good examples of where Wi-Fi 6 and, and 6E will play well into the market. Okay, great. Now, Tony, since we have these six key elements, is this like a secret recipe for Wi-Fi 6 or 6E performance? Yeah, I would love to say it's all, you know, Corvo's secret recipe that we put through to the market. But again, we're keeping this really focused on just what Wi-Fi 6 and 6E brings at almost the consumer level, right? Certainly the box builder and the consumer level. So these are just the areas that any developer from any aspect of the system would want to be focused on. So certainly increased speed, you know, the options of using multiple streams versus the lower amount of streams has increased for Wi-Fi 6 and 6E and gives you that great multi-user MIMO experience. If we look at efficiency, the want at the end user level is to really have a discrete, small form factor that, you know, you can have sitting out on your coffee table. So efficiency becomes extremely important because you've got now 8, 16 streams of Wi-Fi and all of that is is burning energy, burning heat, and you want to get rid of fans and noise and having these big vents. You also want to make it small. And so improving the overall efficiency of the systems, both from the gateway side as well on the client side for handheld devices or anything connecting, really helps focus on that small is beautiful aspect of it. Again, reduce size, and, and so that ties into both board design and product design, as well as you know ways the components can integrate to really facilitate this. If we take a look at increased capacity, and here again, we have more users up to four times more entering into the system and being actively managed, it really becomes important to make sure that there's interference resolution and that they can all coexist and transmit and receive concurrently. And so adding new filtering and ways to manage those connections become very important into the system. Improved performance, here we look at maximizing output power across all available spectrum. So this has driven some interesting, you know, new opportunities for advanced filtering into these markets. 
where again, you really want to have clean spectrum that doesn't disrupt any of the following systems or architectures that sit next to these Wi-Fi spectrum channels. And that really ties again into uh, interference elimination. Here we talk a bit more about coexistence. On many of these systems, you'll have voice activation, you'll have Bluetooth that's streaming music or allowing you to connect to the device. And so you have multiple 2.4 gigahertz devices in the same box. And same thing here, right? You really want a robust experience where they don't disrupt each other or interrupt each other, but you can have good concurrent operation. Okay, great. Now, Tony, where exactly does this 6E come in? Absolutely. So this was a hugely exciting aspect of the Wi-Fi growth over the years here. And at the 20-year mark, we really had another 1.2 gigahertz of new Wi-Fi spectrum open up uh, in the U.S. And it, it drove it really hard. And globally, we see a lot more attraction to this. This brings now a, a spectrum that's at the really high end of the 5 gigahertz space, all the way up to 7.125 gigahertz. These are all new channels. And if you take a look, you know, Wi-Fi has been able to increase the amount of data it sends in the same amount of time and burst length by increasing the size of these channels. And so we show here kind of notches from 20 megahertz, 40, 80, and 160. And those 160 megahertz channels today are the largest, you know, size that really have the fastest bandwidth and capacity capabilities. With that, we get seven new channels with this new spectrum. And you know, when we overlay that on the previous systems, which also have disruption and satellite type channels and other spectrum conflicts, this really opens up a whole new space to have very clean, very dedicated, both backhaul communications and also communication to all the end devices. Okay, so Tony, I see a lot of UNIIs listed here. Is this some kind of Wi-Fi unicorn? <laughs> <laughs> I would love it to be, but unfortunately, yeah, it, it sometimes is magic under the hood when you look at some of this. But this is an interesting overlay on this channel to look at what we had both in the current 5 gigahertz spectrum, which we call Uni1 to Uni2A. And I'll talk a little bit about this division as we get into how the mesh Wi-Fi actually operates. We also have then Uni 2C and Uni 3. We have the small space in Uni 4 that's grayed out here. And then we get this whole new expansion for 7E. And what we see is, again, you know, having contiguous 160 megahertz channels really have some restrictions because of radar use and DFS channels that are used in this spectrum. All of 6E bringing on this new spectrum from Uni 5 to Uni 8 creates a great opportunity for growth. And we'll foreshadow a bit into Wi-Fi 7 and where that's taking us. And there we expect to have 320 megahertz channels. And so you can see just in the spectrum that we'll have the opportunity to have three running 320 megahertz channels uh, at any given time to really get the super fast next generation Wi-Fi. Okay, so Tony, when it comes to this standard, is everyone on board or will my cousins in New Zealand have to live with video streaming at 2.4 gigahertz? From the early announcements that kicked off, we are seeing a lot of regulatory releases already occur and continuing to occur. The latest exciting news, and, and this is a great overlay from Wi-Fi Alliance, uh, courtesy of them, to really show the updates of where each of the nations have come on board to utilize the spectrum. And some of it is not the full spectrum, right? We do see areas that are only looking at Uni 5, that 5925 to 6425 megahertz, but some then considering again, as the US did, the full spectrum. We also see that kind of tied to once some decisions have been made, reconsidering the spectrum growth. So there's a lot of discussions today about Europe, who originally really focused on that Uni 5, considering now opening up to the full spectrum. So a lot of advancements, a lot of uh, great nations already on board here to utilize this space, and we expect many, many more to come on board to take advantage of this unlicensed spectrum. Great. Now, Tony, what should most consumers expect to see on the shelves when it comes to routers and gateways that support this 6 gigahertz? Yeah, I would say, you know, as we look at right now the onset of Wi-Fi 6, 
the work from home, the pandemic impacts of homeschooling and homeworking and really consolidating and needing a home network with great capabilities for all the access and multiple clients that are, are using things like video streaming and audio throughout the day. That really drove an acceleration in Wi-Fi 6 rollout, specifically in, in the home networking. So the gateways today and the routers are very heavily leaning towards and accelerating the deployment of Wi-Fi 6. 6E will then really start opening up the spectrum. We've seen some mobile phones already. So, you know, sometimes unique where the client devices are getting ahead of the infrastructure itself, but that is helping to accelerate the onset of bringing the six gigahertz space again into your home network and into the work and campus networks. There's been early deployments already, and we expect at the end of year to see continuous deployments of both gateways and router systems, and really a continuous advancement of Wi-Fi 6 increasing in, in the percentage of deployments, and then 6E, you know, really starting to take on an onset by the end of this year going forward. So, Tony, I'm hearing buzz about Wi-Fi 7 already and its promise of sophisticated video applications, especially for enterprise. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, great question. I mean, I, I think the opportunities for Wi-Fi 7 and the onset of what we're seeing really at this early deployment level and engagement with the standards bodies and, and how we would implement this is becoming extremely exciting, right? Because we're talking again, four times, you know, improvements in the throughput at the client, right? So going from the 10 gigabits up to the 46 gigabit seconds. Two times the bandwidth, the channels are gonna double again in terms of the max capability from 160 megahertz channels to 320 megahertz channels. And you get much more efficient use of these channels and whether they're contiguous and right next to each other or non-contiguous and separated throughout the spectrum, the way the system will operate will really give great benefit to passing higher data throughputs and the demands that will continue to drive into our home and enterprise use. You'll see some other things here that focus on, you know, the linearity, which is one of the technical specs that drives how much data can be sent per a time slot. Spatial springs, again, we talked about multi-user MIMO. Here we have the potential to double again from, you know, eight by eight max limits of uplink and downlink multi-user MIMO to 16 by 16. So a lot of just enhancements being looked at. You can see the technical benefits here, you know, in this slide that drive through there, higher data rates, lower latency, you know. So from the video perspective, which you mentioned, and if we look at advancements of things like gaming or VR and those kind of applications, as well as potential, you know, user connectivity for industrial monitoring, that lower latency that the system brings as well is going to be a good highlight and advancement in Wi-Fi systems going forward. So, Tony, Wi-Fi 6, 6E, and the future 7 will all help with solid Wi-Fi coverage. Can you explain a little bit about how that is achieved? If we look at how deployments in Wi-Fi existed, you know, and just going back a, a generation or two, you would have a gateway or a router in your house. Typically, it would be a dual band. So you'd have a 2.4 gigahertz path and you'd have a 5 gigahertz path. The diagram on the left here shows that dual band configuration. So here you could also have multiple streams, right, per the standards of how many, depending on what standard you were using, you could utilize. And it gives basically non-separated connectivity within the spectrum. So if you were connected to 2 gig, you could have certainly some multiple users, but now you're time basing those user intersections and same in 5 gig. If we look at the mesh Wi-Fi or easy mesh or, you know, the tri-band applications as noted here, here we're actually utilizing the 5 gigahertz spectrum, which was broader than the 2 gigahertz, and we divided it. So it brings back that sort of unicorn look into the uni spectrum where you had uni 1 to 2A servicing, let's say, all client communications. So anything connecting and speaking with the router would be on those channels. And on the bottom part here, where you see the dedicated backhaul, we would take the upper spectrum of five gigahertz. So, you know, two C to three uni and utilize that just for the backhaul that's talking to the core gateway in the house. And so here you have basically concurrent operation where the client's communicating to all the different nodes and routers and extenders in the home. And then at the same time, they're communicating back with the core gateway that's then connected to either cable, fiber, cellular that gets you back to the cloud. 
And so you get full home coverage, you get greater capacity of the communication nodes and being able to speak to each of these localized routers without it disrupting the fact that you have a clean backhaul that's dedicated to carry all that information back and forth. And this really is is what set a, a really manageable and configurable capability to have whole home coverage that really gets rid of any dead spots through the house. That would be great. Now, Tony, I've heard lots of talk about how to get capacity in Wi-Fi 6 and 6E, but I also heard you mention filtering is needed to get better performance. So how is Corvo in particular going about this? Within Wi-Fi, we looked hard at filtering and obviously within cellular communications and other markets, filtering was heavily used. In Wi-Fi, it was mostly initially used as a coexistence requirement. So you can see the top right, the coex boost filters that we have would be really ensuring that there's no disruption while operating next to cellular bands or operating in concurrence with Bluetooth. So that was one very common use of filtering. As we got to maximizing the range of the routers in the home, Typically what would happen, and I'm going to look at two gigahertz spectrum specifically here first, is you have three core channels roughly, you know, your channel one, six, and 11, that would be your widest channels in two gig. And to operate at full power, you would always have to be center of the spectrum. And as you got to the outer channels, you would have to back down the power. And this way you wouldn't have spurious emissions into, again, the other standards and and neighboring frequencies. So what we found is if by dedicating filtering that allowed really the separation outside of this spectrum, you can now operate these channels at full power equally, and you have a much better range of options to both survive the coexistence with other two gigahertz communications ongoing, as well as getting full coverage if you had to change channels and move. And so we saw a good, you know, roughly 40% extension of range. And I think here you'll see the up to the 78% range extension, really helping to get that full home coverage. Uh, Again, this would all be on two gigahertz. So there you're, you're limited a little bit by bandwidth of the channel. But of course, two gigahertz also gives you the longest range capabilities just from the, the RF frequencies themselves. The last focus here was band boost filters, and this really is where we talked about the easy mesh or the Wi-Fi mesh system and dividing the communication between the client communication and the backhaul and just making sure that it is truly dedicated, split, and taking full advantage of that spectrum for a concurrent operation. So, Tony, there seems to be a lot going on in a front-end module here. Where does this all fit? There is a lot. So if we look specifically at the type of products we make, you know, Corvo as a whole, and certainly within our Wi-Fi devices, we make highly integrated modules that include power amplifiers, low noise amplifiers, switches. And as we've continued to evolve the filtering, we've begun integrating these advanced filters as well. And and we call these devices IFEMs. So essentially, you know, a quick look at the layout of this, you'll see these dielectric resonator five gig filters, the beige boxes. What we've been able to do is actually develop bulk acoustic wave filters and integrate into our devices in roughly the same form factor that we already had servicing all the other functions. And so now we can get rid of a major space requirement on the boards, improve the integration, improve time to market for our customers, really help simplify and improve the overall complexity of of the RF portion of these designs through integration. As we see often in evolution of any standard, right, more integration continually occurs. No difference here in the Wi-Fi front-end solutions. So these Wi-Fi front-end modules are really integrated, and designers can provide smaller form factors. But this is just for Wi-Fi, right? We mentioned smart home earlier, but what about IoT? Yeah, so if we look at the smart home today, what we see is just a very fragmented technology landscape, a mixture of different range for technologies, different applications, right? Some for content, so looking at data throughput, some for sense and control, right? So if we look at the smart home and our our way to really get engaged with the environment and monitor the environment from temperature to lighting to, you know, water sensors, 
to then proprietary solutions that are, are bringing up networks, both for service providers and industries to have, you know, really dedicated solutions of protecting their data and throughputs. Those different application standards then span over ranges, right? So certain technologies have different size ranges. So you have this mix of range, capacity, efficiency, whether it's plugged into a wall or whether it needs to be battery operated, that really makes a complex division of technology. Because of that, I think the smart home today has remained really fragmented. We have definitely solutions and we see broader applications now tying into specific ecosystems. But what we don't see is a broad ability for mix and match across all these ecosystems to then work concurrently together. Integration is certainly a prime factor here to to the core question of any of these standards. Uh, And so you'll see just as the evolution of Wi-Fi, the evolution of cellular, that more integration is continued because it drives the size reduction, it reduces the complexity, it adds the additional functionality by scoping and, and miniaturizing some more of the design facets. But here, when we talk about really the fragmentation, it's more of the interaction again between the systems and the interoperability for the end user. Can I go buy X product off the shelf, bring it to my home network and have it either auto facilitate itself and and join the network without a lot of handholding or a lot of other hardware and equipment that I need to attach to my existing network? So the good news is we're seeing some positive trends of paths away from this. And and again, standardization helps and maturity of, of evolution of the technology will help here. That makes sense. Now, Tony, this does seem quite complex and it will help maybe with everyone in my household having their favorite device, you know, Amazon, Apple for this person, Samsung for this person. Yeah, absolutely. I think if we take a look at the the next slide here, you know, when we move away from the standards, now the network ecosystems become even more complex, right? So as you mentioned, if you look at the application layer up top, this really ties into to what you were mentioning, right? You have, you know, Alexa, you have iOS, you have smart things. You know, today very fragmented, their own ecosystems, their own application layers. Within those systems, the devices and gadgets that are, are enabled do interoperate very well, right? And have continued to mature over time. But what we see happening is, is in this network transport layer across all these different physical RF frequency standards and connectivity standards, really a cooperation amongst all these big players to create what is now called chip today, and it is connected home over IP, internet protocol. And so this layer will help bridge between all these different standards and really bring together a converged smart home that has interoperability capabilities to help solve this fragmentation. So it's a really positive you know, activity, again, amongst all the major players in the industries. So we're really excited to see this progress forward. So, Tony, Chip has all of these really big companies working together, which is absolutely fantastic. But how does this all make my home coverage with Wi-Fi with 6 or 6E or 7 simpler and just work better? This is what we, you know, have been indicating and, and really calling a pod per room. And it drives this whole mesh mentality and utilizing really Wi-Fi networking as the core connectivity standard for all these different activities and and interoperability. This picture depicts, you know, again, if we look at the base station and a 5G femto cell, that's our connectivity to the cloud coming to the house and into this core gateway, that gateway itself, you can see a lot of connections already, right? You see connections and and the black dots, which are clients that are just operating via Wi-Fi to that gateway. So it's using it as a router. There's obviously uh, some audio streams here shown between different devices, as well as audio on the device itself, so that you could actually communicate and talk to the router, uh, give commands, order new Amazon-type devices, for example. You see UWB, which gives us some precise location, which we're really excited and think in the future, adding this kind of functionality will help better configure the home network and, and optimize it by knowing exactly where the router is located. And then we see this, you know, light bulb in here, which is really showing and and depicting the IoT portion connecting into the same router. 
So if in that core Wi-Fi router, we add IoT connectivity that is really multi-standard to look after, you know, Zigbee and Thread and BLE, and to concurrently be able to listen to attach and engage that smart home devices localized around this router, we then start simplifying the overall capability without adding all this complex additional hardware and different gateways and routers. From that main router, you'll see, you know, three streams going out to three remote routers. Uh, and this is the mesh aspect we talked about. The spectrums will be divided. So whether we divide them in five gigahertz, as shown here, where we have specific channels that use one portion of the five gig spectrum, just connecting the different nodes to the main gateway, and then the nodes themselves communicating to all the attached devices on the other side of that five gig spectrum. Or what's going to be really clean is as we move to 6E, having those backhaul connections go to 6 gigahertz. There is lack of congestion there. You have this clean spectrum. You have these wide channels. It really gives some great throughput and advantage to using that as backhaul type clients. And then each of the devices themselves will still be communicating both, you know, 2 gig, 5 gig, or even if we split that 6 gig, you can have them speaking also to these new clients, as we mentioned, cell phones that have 6E communicating over 6 gigahertz as well to the routers. And so each of these become a little more localized in their areas throughout your home, throughout your campus, because of the short range connectivity of the IoT connectivity, they each have the capability to connect to those IoT devices. And then the backhaul carries all that communication back to the cloud. So it's a really neat way to look at realizing the smart home, taking advantage of the Wi-Fi 6, 60 system and, and mesh network capability to really realize a lot of throughput and capacity of user connections throughout the house. Okay. Well, Tony, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, really, we look at Wi-Fi 6 and 6E as unlocking unsurpassed capabilities of home coverage, client communication, and optimizing those backhaul links. That mated with the harmonization of open standards, which then creates coexistence and interoperability, creates a homogeneous network environment, right? So now you have integrated control, monitoring, you have the ability to speak and have vocal commands through your core home network. And it really starts realizing all the strength and capabilities that a smart home could bring. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Tony. This has been super cool. Excellent. Thank you so much, Amelia. It's been great after a few years to kind of recap and uh, catch back on board how fast Wi-Fi has been moving in the industry. So appreciate the opportunity as well and look forward to the next one. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Corvo. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash EE Journal. <laughs>